hello everyone and welcome back to the Pure Mental Health Podcast. So this is an episode that is focused on the BAME side of our podcast. So BAME stands for Black, Asian and Ethnic Minorities. Uh, so we have a very special guest here today, but let's introduce ourselves first. So hello everyone, my name is Akansha. Hello everyone, my name is Esther. Hello everyone, my name is E. So welcome Dr. Khan to our mental health podcast. Can you introduce yourself, tell us the work you do and your journey to becoming Chef Executive of Bernardo's? Uh, hello everyone, delighted to be with you this afternoon. My name is Javed Khan, uh, so please call me Javed. Uh, and I'm the hugely, hugely privileged Chief Executive of Bernardo's. And Bernardo's is a 155-year-old charity, but not any old charity. It's actually the largest children's charity in the United Kingdom. And so I'm very, very proud to be its chief executive. I, I've been working for over 35 years now. It's a very long time. Must sound, I must sound very, very old to you. Uh, and I've done kind of seven different professions in that time. Began life as a maths teacher, would you believe? So if you need any help with fractions or algebra or anything, just say I can help you out. Uh, and then I worked my way through the education system. I was a director of education in, in a, local, a local council, a government, a local government. I worked in central government as well. And this is my second chief executive position. I was used to be chief executive of Victim Support, which is a large national charity as well. And then Bernardo's about seven years ago. Uh, and what, what Bernardo's kind of does for me is give me the chance to work at a very large scale across all four nations of the United Kingdom and do something that is very close to my heart. And that is to do everything we can to create a better world for vulnerable children and young people. Those children who have had uh, the love in their lives snatched away from them for no, no uh, re reason that they are in control of, it just may be the family that they're born into, the environment that they grew up in, the things that happened to them or were done to them that have uh, damaged their childhood. And Bernardo's works with 0 to 25 year olds, trying to help them cope with what life has thrown at them, help them recover from it. And then hopefully if we get that right, lead, lead into a, uh, a future that is positive for them so that they can become adults who can look after themselves and contribute to society as well. And so, you know, every year we support well over 350,000 vulnerable children, young people, their families, their carers. And as you can probably tell, I'm very passionate about it. You know, it's it's what I get up in the morning for and what I really, really enjoy doing. Um, well, it's a very interesting um, journey that you've had to becoming chief executive. So one of our first questions for you is, is the first ever non-white CEO of Bernardo's and it's really long history and you are essentially a trailblazer in that respect. How do you feel about that attachment to your role as chief executive and why did you accept the position? Well, I, I needed no persuasion to accept the position. You know, as I say, it was an absolute privilege. It was a no brainer. You know, as soon as I knew the job was available, I went for it and then, you know, luckily I got it. Uh, but being the first non-white chief executive of this amazing, amazing charity, which, got, you know, began in the times of Queen Victoria, so a very, very long time ago, being that person carries with it considerable responsibility as well. Uh, I mean, that responsibility would come for anybody doing this job, but being a, a non-white senior leader has additional considerations. And so I take that very, very seriously as well. You know, people, uh, there are very few people who look like me, come from the cultural background that I have, who get into roles like this. Very, very rare and few and far between. So those of us that do make it, and you know, I don't think there's anything special about me. You know, I mean, I'm a, I'm a very spirit, spiritual person. I think there's a greater power in control that has given me this opportunity. My job is to do 110% every single day in that job, make the most of it, make as much of a difference as I can and not worry about tomorrow. But I do recognize that, you know, being a member of the BAME community, being a BAME senior leader, there are many people out there that uh, might look up to me, you know, might see me as a role model. And so, uh, and I take uh, uh, that, that role very seriously. So I often go out of my way to speak to young people from diverse backgrounds, you know, trying to encourage them, trying to inspire them to do work like this. 
And hopefully what they can see when they meet me is that firstly, I'm just like any other normal human being. There's nothing special about me, really. And and I look at the three of you, Esther, Kansha and uh, Yi, uh, uh, I, any of you could do exactly what I'm doing in the future. And so I, that's what I try to do, to try and take that message out to BAME communities and say, look, there's nothing special about me. If I could do it, so could you. And to give you just one example, my own parents who emigrated from the land of Kashmir in the north of Pakistan in the late 50s, neither of them could read or write in any language whatsoever. They'd never been to school throughout their lives, never been touched by the magic wand of education and had a tough existence. But one thing they were very good at was loving their children because we had love in abundance. We didn't have any material possessions, but we had love and that love you know, is really important for today's children as well. But if I, you know, from illiterate parents could achieve this, imagine what you guys can achieve in your lifetimes. Yeah, that is amazing. And as you mentioned earlier as well, you were a teacher and you worked very closely with young people. You still work very closely with them. And I presume you've seen firsthand the impact of mental health difficulties especially in BAME community. Um, could you please share your experience as a student and as a teacher and as a chief executive now working with students and people from BAME and the BME community? How has it been and how has it influenced you? Well, th this is a subject very close to my heart and very close to the mission of Bernardo's as well. You know, there are many things that we do, but there is a common thread in the support that we provide to, to children and young people and the challenges that they are showing and mental health is right at the core of that mental health and well-being I would say in its broadest sense. Uh, my own experience you know even when I was a frontline teacher many years ago taught me some very important things about young people's lives and, and how to be an effective teacher and one of the most powerful lessons was that you may be a brilliant teacher, you may have a fantastic lesson plan and all the resources and everything else, but that doesn't really matter or work when, it, when, when a young child, a young person who's in your classroom is trying to cope in a, with a whole range of other stuff that is not in that classroom. And it could be with what's going on at home in their own family, their circumstances, which has made them socially anxious, which has made them very, very worried, concerned. It could be worried about their parents, you know, worried about themselves, their own self-esteem, uh, could be worried about, you know, other friends that they've got who are in great difficulty, and that is affecting their mindset. So as a teacher, you have to understand that the whole child in front of you is what you need to try and educate. Not simply that you've got a lesson plan and you start it and you finish it, and therefore you think everybody's learned something. No, they haven't. You've got to understand the, the, you know, the, the human being in front of you and provide the wraparound support that gets them to a state of mind which enables them to learn. Now, fast forward that to my experience in Bernardo's, you know, and the current statistics are pretty stark that one in every six young people in this great country of ours has a mental health issue. And the vast majority of those, the mental health issue is undiagnosed or unsupported. And things have got really tough in the last five or 10 years in this country where mental health challenges have got more severe and the support services have got less and less resources to be able to respond. So now if you've got you know, initial signs of social anxiety, for example, there's hardly anybody out there that will support you because the CAM services that you might be familiar with, child, adolescent, mental health services, their thresholds for support are now so high that you've got to be in serious difficulty before they will intervene. I'm totally against that and I make lots of very public speeches and speak to government ministers and issue press releases arguing for more resources to be put in so that young people can be supported at the first sign of difficulty. When a classroom teacher, because classroom teachers are brilliant at this, they can spot when a child is not maybe not concentrating or there is something else on their mind which is affecting their behavior or the way that they're talking or the way that they dress that morning. Are they looking disheveled? You know, are they looking really hungry? Something else is going on. But the teachers don't have the resources to do much about that because they're not counselors, they're not therapists. Right? And they need support. So that's what I'm arguing for from the Bernardo's platform. But you make a really good point about the BAME children and the disproportionate representation of challenges for BAME young people at the moment. And the COVID pandemic has made that worse 
all the data shows that, and our data in Bernardo's shows that as well. It's got much worse. And there are many reasons for that. So COVID has disproportionately affected BAME communities. Uh, you know, they're, they're more, uh, uh, have a higher proportion of BAME communities getting COVID in the first place, and then a uh, much harder chance for them to survive it. So there's great, you know, higher proportional bereavement within BAME communities and young people who tend to, if they get it, they do survive it, but they've got family, relatives, extended family, people in their communities that they know who have got it really bad or, dare I say, died from it. So they're suffering bereavement loss as well without the support to cope with it. So that adds to their mental health issues as well. Many young, BAME young people are carers themselves looking after elderly people. So the worry and the concern that they have for their parents or their grandparents or an uncle or an aunt who they're caring for adds to it all. So what do we do about this then? Well, Bernardo's is doing some really good work at the moment. I'm really pleased to say, you know, we launched a program called See, Hear, Respond last year, which has uh, so far supported 53,000 young people who have become the victims of COVID, if you like, the hidden victims as I call them, they didn't have social workers, they didn't have special needs, education, healthcare plans, or anything like that. But because of COVID, they now found themselves in great difficulty. And within that, we realized that actually lots of people were accessing the service, but BAME children and young people were not accessing it as much as they should have been. So we launched a second service called BOLO, B-O-H-L-O-H. BOLO means speak in many uh, minority languages. South Asian languages in particular. And it's exactly what it says on the tin. This is about giving young people from BAME communities and their families an opportunity to get in touch. There's a, there's a telephone number that they can ring. We have uh, therapists online. We have project workers, support workers who can speak multiple languages as well. So language is an issue. And we're seeing the numbers go up day by day on the number of BAME people who are accessing that line specifically because it's designed for them. So, you know, any listeners out there, anybody who's got any challenge they're facing, any young people, you know, feel that there's nobody out there listening, please get in touch with Bernardo's. You can go on our website. All the information is there. There's a telephone number I can give you as well to call. And it's confidential, totally confidential. You will get the support from Bernardo's workers because this is why we exist. It's to support those of you out there that need that support. Yeah, um, actually, we were just going to touch on that as well. So just to reiterate that Bernardo's, Bernardo's has launched a COVID helpline called BOLO, which does mean like speak up in many languages. Um, you've just told us how like people can access it and what it involves. Um, just to kind of touch on that, how has it supported the community throughout the pandemic? And do you think it will continue for a while? Or like, what are your plans uh, surrounding that? So do you mean the service or the pandemic? Uh, the service, the helpline. Okay, because yeah, we don't know what's going to happen with the <laughs> yeah. pandemic. If you know, please tell me, because we, we all hope and pray it's going to end soon and the vaccines are going to work and, and so on, and then we can get back to some sense of, you know, norm, normal uh, living, because at the moment it isn't like that. But, you know, I have no idea how long this is going to go on for. So our services, you know, I'm very, very hopeful are going to continue. Uh, a lot of it depends on us getting, getting the money from government to help keep funding and employing the people. So we're in negotiations with them at the moment to extend. At the moment, we've got an agreement till the end of March for See, Here Respond. And BOLO, we've got a further extension already till later in the year. We hope that both of these services are going to be carrying on. We're frantically trying to raise money in a whole range of ways. So we just a few weeks ago launched a uh, Children in Crisis Appeal. Bernardo's and we're appealing to everybody out there, all of your listeners as well, and everybody that we can reach uh, to donate to it. So go to our website, bernardos.org.uk and donate whatever you can. If you haven't got any money, then please give us your best wishes as well. Your prayers count as well at these really difficult times. Yeah, um, we've already, um, we've already talked about it in earlier questions, but um, in less privileged communities of the UK, I mean, young people, I, I've looked around me, there's a very like less reach out to people in less privileged areas and poor areas. And how would it extend to those people in those areas? Because it's harder not being, a BA, being the BAME communities and it's worth being in a poor community as well. So how would it extend to them? Sorry, I didn't catch all of that question. 
I really apologize. Oh, yes. Try that again. <laughs> I mean, young people in BME communities who are in poor areas, how do they extend to them? Because I'm yet to see an extension to people. Yeah, so how, 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 do we, how do we reach young people in poor areas? Yeah, 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 yeah. got it. Great question. So one of the things we're doing with See, Here Respond is that Bernardo's isn't doing this on its own. So we, right from the start, we said that we wanted to build a partnership of lots of providers small providers who work in communities like the ones you're describing, the poorest areas in this great country of ours, and bring them under the umbrella of Bernardo. So we do all the legwork, raise the money, get the contract from the government and so on, and set up all of the systems. And then we bring in these partners. And we've brought together over 80 partners, large and small, national and local, who are working with us to deliver those services. And we are distributing the money to them so they can employ local people from those local communities. You're talking about people who live on those streets, who know those families, who know the children, and there's a bond of trust there so that the young, the young people and their families will access that support. So that's our way, and it, as I say, it's worked brilliantly. 53,000 people have accessed that support. That's uh, physical support. And then uh, another 300,000 have accessed all the online resources as well, because everybody's working digitally now, so so I, I think that's the really important model. In fact, so successful has it been that we're thinking in Bernardo's that virtually every project we do, we're going to develop in in terms uh, uh, in ways that bring in local players like that in a uh, in a partnership that Bernardo supports. So we've learned a lot from it. They say they've learned a lot from it as well. And most importantly, those you know some people say hard to reach young people are the ones who have benefited most. Yeah. Okay. Um, so they, so today's last question. So finally, since we are in another lockdown and the situation has no words to describe it, is there any tips or ways that people can improve their mental health? And how have you been coping with lockdown? So, uh, I, you know, I think everybody suffered. So firstly, it's not just young people and people shouldn't think if they are suffering at the moment, they got difficulties, challenges they can't understand. Please don't think this is just happening to you and you know you're, there's something wrong with you because they're not. Everybody, including myself, all adults and young people have had to face a new reality during the pandemic. You know, we've all had to kind of uh, stop going to our normal workplaces in many cases. We've not been able to travel, we've not been able to see family, our loved ones. You haven't been able to do religious faith celebrations, you know, and this takes its toll on everybody. But young people in particular, because you're still growing, because you're still learning about yourself, who you are and what you believe in and what you want to achieve, then there's the pressure of learning and exams and stuff like that. It's been particularly difficult where all of that stuff has been taken away from many, many young people, you know, and, and I know as a teacher, you know, many young people really look forward to school because it's a it's an oasis for them. Often when they've got challenges at home, they come into school and they know the teachers are there just for them and they've got their friends around them. And that socializing, that support, that network is really, really important. And now people are having to, you know, sit in front of a computer like this all day and try and learn their lessons. And it's not the same. You know, it's not the same. You know, you can't interact in the same way. Uh, and so it's really difficult. So I would encourage people to do what they can to look after themselves, right? Because if you don't look after yourself, nothing else is going to work for you anyway. And that means take breaks. So don't sit hour after hour after hour in front of your laptop. Uh, or your tablet or something like that. Take breaks, try and do short bursts, go for a walk, even if it's just around the house or if you've got a garden or the local street, get some fresh air. Exercise is really, really important, you know. In that five minute walk, you might think, well, I'm not actually doing much exercise, it's just a gentle stroll. But the fresh air is really good for your brain. It's very, very good and it takes you away from what you were doing and then you can go back and you'll be much more effective and productive. Try and stay in touch with your friends. I would encourage, you know, uh, through phones and WhatsApp and so on. Don't overdo it. That doesn't mean middle of the night you're doing it, because I think I would also say ditch the technology at night. Get it out of your bedroom. Don't you know, it's very, very tempting to have it there. But when it pings, when that message comes through, the brain gets alerted and then, you, you know, it's irresistible to pick it up and, and uh, you know, and resist trying to read that message and it disturbs your sleep. And all of the research shows that if you don't have a good night's sleep, whatever age you're at, if you don't have a good night's sleep, you can't function during the day. And in young people's cases, you can't learn 
effectively doing it. It'll take you twice as long, three times as long to learn about algebra than it would if I was teaching you. But you know, <laughs> if if you got a good night's sleep, you know what I mean. So take you know simple steps like that. Try and be kind to yourself as well. Don't push yourself so hard that it begins to hurt. And be kind to your friends. You know, one of the things I've and we've spotted that through these Zoom and Teams meetings and you know the, your your kind of uh, telephone messages to each other, often um, the language is not the same as if you were face to face. You know, because you can spot each other's body language, you can give each other a hug, you know, you can smile and so on in different ways. Whereas when you're staring at this screen, because it's so intense that you know the body language doesn't quite react in the same way. And when you're writing down messages. You can often use the wrong word that you wouldn't have used if you were sitting with somebody uh, or it can be misread by someone and it can feel a bit abrupt, you know, and a bit nasty. So be kind to yourself and kind to others as well, because we all need to get through this. And hopefully, you know, we hope and pray that it's not going to be too long when all of you are going to be back together in your little huddles, supporting each other. Most importantly, though, you know, old fogies like me, it's in our interest that we do what we can for you because you're the future. Right. When we're old and pensioners and walk on walking sticks, you're the ones who are going to be running this country. You're going to be running Bernardo's and you're going to be in government and you're going to be making those big decisions that are going to affect our lives as pensioners. So it's in our interest to do the best for you at the moment. Yeah. Wow. Um, this has been like a really good session for us. And we've learned so much. It's been very informative and we've enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Dr. Khan, for joining us. Um, is there any extra information about Bernardo's you want to drop before you leave? So I mentioned See, Hear, Respond. That's a really good program. If anybody needs help, you know, and tell other people as well, if you don't need it yourself, get in touch. Uh, the Bolo helpline I mentioned, the number is 0800 151 Please do call it, even if it's on behalf of somebody else. We'll, we'll provide as much support as we possibly can. If you can raise money for Bernardo's, that'd be fantastic because we spend it back on children and young people. And it's very, very easy. Just get onto our website, you know, bernardo's.org.uk, press donate. Well, however small it is, pennies make pounds. So, you know, every donation is very gratefully received. And, you know, one, one thing we do, which I'm very proud of, is that for every pound that we raise, we spend 91 pence on children in the front line. You might think, why isn't it 100%? Why is it 100, 100 pence? But, it can't, you know, we've got a nine pence pays for all of the, the buildings and the people. It pays for me and all the other stuff. And that is really, really uh, sector leading. You know, 91 pence is one of the best out of all of the charities that are out there. I'm really proud of that. So any anybody who donates money to Bernardo's can be pretty sure that their money is making going to make a huge difference to the lives of vulnerable children. As I say, children who have had the love taken out of their lives. They've been exploited, they've been abused, they're living in domestic violence households, you know, they're living in care, uh, they've got all kinds of physical and mental challenges and so on. And, you know, we want a society that cares about the most vulnerable all the time. We must never take our eye off the ball, really. And unfortunately, during the pandemic, those numbers have gone up, not down. So we need everybody's help to try and do a better job than we're currently doing. Yeah, that was amazing. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank My you. pleasure, totally. You know, I have great faith in you guys. You are the future. Never forget it. Right? Think yeah. big, aim for the top, and you're going to get there. <laughs>